So here we are. We are on the hindsight, which is where we talk about our members, their lives, and discuss the moments that define them in their service. And today we have Captain Melissa De Palma. And who are you, and what do you do? So I am the I am the acting G six for the Rhode Island National Guard. And what's that? <laughs> that is, uh, I am the director of information technology. So everything for computers, networks. Uh, any sort of access for anybody else to essentially do their job. It is my team's responsibility to uh, make sure they can do it. Gosh, all that a captain. That all sounds that like a job a for a colonel. Uh, it should be a job for the colonel. <laughs> so, uh, so what happened? I like to start these podcasts off with uh, once upon a time. Once up, how far back once upon a time do you uh, want to go? That's a great question. Where, where do you want to start? Where do you want to, you want the full story? I want the story that leads you to being our S6 as a uh, O3. I, I'm going to give you the full story. All right, let's start I think, with the full story. I think it's important. All right, so the journey began back in 1989, 1990. A recruiter came to my high school. And they were um, looking for band members. And at the time, yes, I was an absolute band geek. No <laughs> question. And uh, What did you play? Uh, in high school, I was a bass guitar player, bassoon player. Uh, started with clarinet, little guitar. I did go to, later on, we'll get into it, but I went to college for music. So, um, but the recruiter showed up. I took the flyer home to my parents. And I said, this is something I think I'd really like to do. They were fully on board. So in 1990, I joined the Massachusetts Army National Guard. Boo. I know. <laughs> Band, uh, 26 Yankee Division, and uh, signed up as an electric bass player. It was a zero two uniform. So the summer between my junior and senior year of high school, I went to basic training. Uh, back then, I auditioned in, didn't have to go to AIT because I was civilian acquired skills due to my audition level. So I was a 16-year-old E5. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Only in the band. Only in the band was that possible back then. Yeah. Um, I did my six years. I did. I went to Keene State uh, for music education. Uh, at the end of my six years of service, one of the things that happened was Massachusetts disbanded the band from the 26th, and they moved us to Fall River. Now, today, that wouldn't be a problem. At the time, I was living in Keene, New Hampshire. You're asking a college student to drive from Keene, New Hampshire to Fall River more than once a month because a band is not a once a month commitment. It doesn't go so well. So I finished up my commitment. I left. Uh, worked in college. Actually, I did teach for three years. Uh, realized it was not my calling, even though that was the only thing I ever knew. Uh, Decided to kind of switch things up, and I went into higher ed. So I was working in uh, college residential life, campus safety and security. I was a police officer for a little bit. Um, just kind of spent 22 years really working with college kids. The last 13. That sounds awful. <laughs> it was. Like, I can't go to a recruiting event and spend 10 minutes with college age kids. 22 years. I could do God it. God bless you. I want to do it. Wanna... You still are a college age kid. Right? No. <laughs> Not really. No. I mean, long-term student, maybe. <laughs> I'm already looking back at going to college. It's never a bad thing. Of course thing. you Just, are. Yeah. Don't live on LT's it. having a terrible influence on you. She is, yes. <laughs> She's influencing me for that graduate degree. Good Lord. Oh, yeah. You need one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Absolutely. Especially doing what we do with public relations. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't start. <laughs> You're going to be a bad influence on my, on my soldier here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I keep interrupting. No, please, it's please all good. Going. It's all good. So anyway, I worked for 22 years in higher ed. I did obtain, I have a master's degree in organizational design and leadership. Um, got to, I don't know, about 12, 13 years at Johnson and Wales and, and I was getting stagnant. Like I needed professional development. One choice is I could have gone for that doctor degree. I was still paying off my bachelor's degree and that was just not happening. I said, what other avenues are there? Where else can I go? Well, next door to where I worked is the downtown Providence recruiting station. I had half day Fridays. So one Friday I walked in and said, can I come back? And it happened to be Sergeant Echeverry. And she's like, I don't know, you wanna go OCS? And I said, how hard can that be? 
Next thing I know, I'm signing in. Famous last words. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm swearing in and uh, spending 18 months at State OCS. Fantastic pro- program. Highly recommend it. I don't know that I recommend it at 40 years old. <laughs> it does become a challenge. What, what could possibly go wrong at 40? Uh, many, many things. Your <laughs> knees, your ankles, your, your wrists. Um, the lack of sleep doesn't hold up like it did when you were 20. Yeah. Mm, fair. Yeah. yeah fair. Um, but honestly, the best thing I ever did. So I, you know, um, commissioned. Commissioned as a signal officer. So computers, again, I was a band geek. Computers is not all that far away from being a band geek, right? <laughs> so I just traded one kind of nerdy for another. Um, there has to be a joke in there somewhere. It's, it's something. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I commissioned as Signal, and I was lucky enough to, uh, my first assignment was with the defensive cyber operations element out of JFHQ, and I was their team chief. So it, at Johnson & Wales, even though I don't have a tech degree, um, the last, well, actually my entire time at Johnson & Wales, there was an IT component to what I did, because just like everything else in life, everything is moved online. So I did housing. So students were going to select their housing, and I don't know, for those of us who are a bit older, we re- may remember we got a number, and we went to a central location, and you know, when your number was called, you got to go pick your room, and they like marked it off, and you know, there were lines out the door for college housing. Well, today, it's all done online. You do it from your, your room, you do it from home, mom does it for you, whoever, but it's all done online. So my job at Johnson & Wales was to make that online experience happen. Not just for Providence, but Johnson & Wales had four campuses. So Charlotte, Denver, Miami, and Providence. How do I make it happen? So there was a lot of on-the-job learning for very complex IT pieces. So, and they say it takes 10,000 hours to you know, become an expert at something. Well, I did 10,000 hours in what felt like about two weeks. So um, <laughs> trying to get this thing up and running and over years really being able to build it out and getting some really, really good skill. So back to commissioning. I commissioned Signal, DCOE, didn't exactly have the cybersecurity stuff, but understood more of the background, went through some self-teaching, um, you know, trying to figure out, okay, how do we do the cyber piece? And, you know, downloaded free programs and trainings, and and I I attacked my own house and my own network more than once, Um, much to the dismay of the family when things went down because they were getting what we call DOSed and everything just stops. So, but was able to immerse into another side of IT. Now we get into it, it's been three years, I've been with the cyber team, the full-time force, there were a few openings. And I get a call from Colonel Tatro, who is the G6, and he says, you know, I have to look at the future of the department. And he's like, I eventually need a successor. Would you be interested in joining us and maybe eventually becoming my successor? And I'm like, how do I pass that up? You know, get me out of the college thing, let me do something different, and really focus on the nerdy passion of computers that I do have. So I came on full-time in 2018. I started as a system administrator. So in the first understanding had been, I was going to stay in the system administrator position, get to play the tech stuff, because a lot of times officers, we don't get to actually do the work. Right, we do all the paperwork. That's so the way most of us like it, by the way. Can do the work. Yeah, work just sounds awful. It, depending, it's hard. Takes a long time. It does. It makes you sweaty. It does. That's why. Well, we, computer work maybe not as sweaty, <laughs> um, but so it was. It was to get a few years under my belt. The supervisor for this is admins was uh, Chief Brian Tardiff, and he got an amazing opportunity six months into me being full-time for him to go work at state as one of their lead security officers for information technology. Can't pass that up. So he left. I get promoted as the, what we call the ISSB manager. So now I'm in charge of everything 
that you can see and touch for the computers. So it, I, not really, you know, in charge of the network or um, ComSec, like those people, but if it's help desk, if it's a system administrator, it's any of that falls under my purview. So I've been doing that now since, uh, well, 2018, November of 2018. And then last, last September, Colonel Tatro got the opportunity to um, go work for Homeland Security. Another opportunity cannot pass up. So in February, he left his full-time position. And in the signal world, I am the only full-time signal officer employed by the state. Whether it's AGR, whether it's a technician, I'm it. So for now, I'm the ISSB manager and I'm acting as the G6. So that's how I came here. It was, the timeline was greatly accelerated <laughs> by about seven <laughs> years. The military uh, can have its way with doing that. It sure can. Uh, but I, I really wouldn't have it any other way. I wanted yeah. professional development. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> yeah. uh, because that is all I am getting is yeah. professional development right now. But it is, it is definitely turning me into a better leader. Okay. So <clears throat> we have not talked about the DCOE at all mm. on our podcast yet. Mm. So I think this is the first time me, many, if not most of our viewers, will have ever heard those four letters. Gotcha. Could you talk a little bit about the DC DCOE? The DCOE, yes. The DCOE is De uh, Defensive Cyber Operations Element. So it is a... Uh, it is a piece of Joint Force Headquarters. We fulfill one of the four tenants of the TAG's... Um, Lines of effort. Thank you. <laughs> um, yep. So, yeah, I was blanking on that one. It was. I'm like, ah, <laughs> I know it's LOE, but that's not... Uh, yes. So the lines of effort. So the DCOE team is... It is it, we're a small group. It's only, we're only authorized seven people. But it is, it is seven very highly skilled people. Uh, and we, we do a lot of the train assist advise role, uh, but we do have the capability, for example, let, let's say that there was, um, I mean, ransomware is everywhere these days, right? Let's say that there was a town or a state, um, part of the state that got hit by some sort of ransomware. We can go in and help them. We can help them figure out the impact of it, we can help them determine, um, you know, what, what are the steps to, to get back to normal. Uh, we, we will do, you know, vulnerability assessments to be like, this is where someone could get you. So we have the ability to go in and assist, um, you know, with the cyber piece. So, but on the train assist advise level, we've done everything every year. Uh, we work with the Board of Elections. And with, um, you know, Secretary of State, Nellie Gorbea. And it's, we help them determine all aspects of security for the voting. So everything from the machines themselves and how to keep them secure to how they're housing them to physical security to the whole thing. Um, to make sure that, that we have the safest elections we possibly can. We've done things with cities of leagues and towns as far as schools and educating them on cybersecurity and how you protect yourself from things like ransomware. So um, we, we do a lot of outreach that way. So, but again, I mean, it's, we, we, we do have the ability to come in and assist too. Um, you know, we'll, we'll help out any way we can, but that's yeah. DCOE. And you guys have traveled too, right? You guys have supported oh, the God, state yeah. partnership program, Northcom, you guys have gone to trade winds in the Bahamas. Yes, yes. So. Uh, Yes, we go to the Bahamas. There, there was a while we were going quite a bit um, to be able to help them. Uh, but one of the the cool things with being part of cyber is we, we talk about, you know, with the Army or the Air Force, we do ATs, we do exercises, we go simulate what we do. On the cyber team, we do that too. So if you think of your AO, right, cyber has its own AO, it, it's, it's very similar. So we, we still have to do recon. We still need to figure out exactly how big is our AO. Um, we will put out 
there we don't call them LPOPs, but we will put out you know your 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 outpost listening posts. Our, ours are technical, but they're listening for traffic, listening for what's happening. Um, every year we do this really cool thing. It's called Cyber Yankee. So it is a week long. We call it Red on Blue. So it is for us because we're the defensive team. We're the blue team. We're the we're the good guys, right? So we go in and, and we get an AO of a network and we're there to help protect it with a, um, with a civilian owner. You, usually it's like water or power or it's one of your, one of your major um, you know, sort of state infrastructure sources. But we're helping them protect. But there is an adversary, there is an op four who is legit in the next room trying to hack in. And it's all about, can we see it? How do we mitigate it? How do we figure out their, you know, their um, TTPs and where they're gonna go and what they're gonna do? And we spend a week fighting the red team and trying to hold them back so that way they don't stop the water or the electricity. Um, and, and that's the DCOE AT. And it's, it's amazing. So you have Cyber Yankee, there are national ones, there are ones held with the FBI. It's, th this is an industry standard now. So it sounds really exciting. Is this a unit that someone could enlist into? No. Okay, so <laughs> what, does a, what does a human have to do to go from the street to the DCOE? That's a good question. So we are actually, we were actually in my shop talking about this the past couple days um, on how we can do sort of a recruitment drive. So the big part is, is that to be on the DCOE, you have to be a 25 series. Technically, you have to be a 25 Bravo. Which is a network. Yes. Okay. Something. 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 Yes. All right. We'll probably look that up and flash this on screen. Yes, I please. I was just so, thinking that. I, I don't think we're going to leave 25 Bravo right as network something. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe we will. Delta okay. is oh. network defender. I don't remember. You would think I know Bravo is. 25 Bravo Army. Information technology specialists. That's all it says. That's it. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. Okay. So technically, technically, the DCOE is supposed to be 25 deltas, which are network defenders. So, but the thing is, I don't, we don't in this state, we do not have feeders for that. And it's been really, really hard. And the school is incredibly tough. So when DCOEs were started, um, they were started with the 25 Bravos. They transition to the Deltas. I'm trying to get them back to Bravo so I can bring people in and we can be mission cap capable and ready. Got it. So back to the 25 Bravo. Um, security, you, you, there, there are some certs. So things like Security Plus, Certified Ethical Hacker, um, CYSA. So there are certs that we do get. The biggest thing for the DCOE is because attacks change all the time and uh, the technology changes so fast is that you can't just come to drill and be successful like it, it is you have to make the commitment to almost continuously self-study seems and like a theme in your life it is it is <laughs> it is it's all about professional development and getting better learning new things um, but to be successful on the DC or we you have to be willing to put in the time so we're talking about how we can do recruitment tools for that, how we do outreach. Um, Are there any sort of incentives? I don't know. It'd be good to know. It'd be a good, good question That's for Pam Curtis, maybe, when we get her next week. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, is it like a enlistment? It is an enlistment thing. Yeah, enlistment incentive or something. Something. Yeah. I don't know off the top of my head. Maybe the Army so, has something. It, 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 I'm, again, I'm in, I'm in a really weird place. Technically, I'm not on the DCOE team anymore because I am now with SOD-G. So I'm the net ops officer for the special ops detachment. Mm -hmm. So the DCOE is an M-Day function. Um, but because I am sitting in that G6 role, there is still a piece that, like, it, it's still kind of mine, especially right now. Sure, sure. I'm familiar with that. You know what I mean? S same boat, right? So like the one tenth pad right. doesn't belong to me but my full-time capacity has responsibility for what the pad does. Amen. So, so th yeah, that I, is exactly I where I am. I hear you. So, um, yeah, 
So the DCOE is, I'm still trying to work with it, but it doesn't, I'm not on the M day for that. Okay. So um, I'm just going to harp on this because this is really interesting to me. Uh, IT is like so far beyond what I'm familiar with, but I've always found it interesting. Um, So for a a human off the street, right? Mm -hmm. 18 year old kid graduates high school, says to himself, gosh, I'd like a career in cyber. This sounds interesting to me. What can the, the Army Force? do? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Get out of here with that. <laughs> Get a real job. Right. <laughs> um, what, what can the Army do? So we obviously don't have 25 Deltas right. in our formation. Right. So if uh, we have 25 Bravos, mm-hmm. what can an 18-year-old kid who wants to be in cyber expect out of an enlistment into our IT world? So technically... It's almost one of those where you have to start at the IT administrator level, right? Like a system administrator or a help desk or something. Be able to understand how things work. And then cyber is kind of that advanced course, right? So even the DCOE team, the lowest ranking member is an E6. And, and it's the team is, the, the team has a lot of warrant officers. So, and it's because of that, that technical expertise that's required to be on the DCOE team and to be successful. Um, it, it is a higher level, which is also why it's more of like an interview process to get you in. Sure. Um, because it is a higher level under, of understanding. So the thing is, is that if you were to enlist as a 25 Bravo with the National Guard, right? with us we have all kinds of opportunities spread throughout our units where it's everything from you know you can work with the field artillery they have a really large it section um but that's because like their weapon systems and etc they're all computerized these days right so they're they're setting up their own networks their own internal networks they're they're, you know, issuing commands and that sort of thing. I feel like you wouldn't traditionally think of that with big booms. You wouldn't, but everything is computerized these days. So, you know, they have a large section. Aviation has a very large section. So, you know, everything from, and you, you think aviate, well, they fly. Yeah, but they have a huge communication requirement. So they have a very large section. All the MPs have sections and everybody has different technology. We have everything from, you know, uniforms, 25 uniforms, your radio operators, right? But everybody's got to talk. And then certain, uh, the 43rd has this thing we call CPOF. It's Command Post of the Future. (laughs) What is that? Invented Uh, 20 years ago. Correct, (laughs) invented 20 years ago. Command Post in the Air Force, I don't think is the same thing as your Command Post. Why not? (laughs) Yours probably works. Correct. Well, CPOF works. um, Uh, With a very loose definition of work. You just have to use, you know, the the Atari Pong devices (laughs) to make it work. So Command Post of the Future is a... It is a um, like a jock or a talk uh, command suite that if you can figure it correctly and it works, you can actually do the overlays with blue force trackers and et cetera. And you can track units in a battle in the field. Um, like, like it's literally your common operating picture. Yeah. So command control communications. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, the finished product. The, the thing that actually is displayed looks an awful lot like Photoshop and PowerPoint had a, <laughs> no. a child out of wedlock. <laughs> uh, but if you have familiarity with any Office and or Adobe products, um, it's especially frustrating because none of the command functions work the same. So you can see the finished product. Oh. You say, mm-hmm. oh, these are layers. I should be able to manipulate this like layers. And the answer is no, you, you, you cannot. Uh, or this looks like a PowerPoint. I should be able to do PowerPoint things. And, and the answer there is, of course, no, no, you cannot. Um, so and there you like go. There's, there's CPOF in a nutshell. It's like media. someone yes. took a snapshot of PowerPoint and was like, I'm going to recreate this and got all of the commands wrong. The entire UI interface is just completely backwards. In theory, it sounds like great, a great thing for command and control. It should be because like it, you can imagine that having an instant messenger, a PowerPoint and like a, a powerful graphical tool mm-hmm. together packaged would be like a great way to lead. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, lead a formation. And in theory it is, except the UI is designed by like six-year-olds. 
it, it's complete nonsense. Correct. Yeah. But on our end, for the signalier, not so much the operator, because uh, the thing is, is that it's, you know, our job as signaliers is to set that up. It is usually its own network. Um, we got to create all the functionality. Once we get it up and running, we turn it over to a three shop, right? <laughs> And we promptly destroy it. And you promptly <laughs> destroy it and break things, which means we wow. have job security to keep fixing it. But we're not the operators of CPOF, but we we do the setup to make sure it works. Something that's always interest me, interested me about like communications or signal is, you know, you have the ability to get out and you network with people because your business is making things, making IT work for people. So I've found that I've made a lot of friends along the way because my background, actually, I came from Com 2. Mm. So. Well, you're Air Force. Of course you did in Rhode Island. Is there anything else besides common oh, in the yeah, Air Force? Yeah. Maybe a couple aircraft. Maybe, Maybe a couple. Couple. <laughs> a couple security forces, but mostly Air Com. Yeah, it was so strange. So for the first eight years of my life, um, I was in, or not of my life, for the first eight years of my career in the Air Force, I was in the Combat Communication Squadron. It has nothing to do with aircraft. No. <laughs> it has not a single thing. ARCOM does not even talk to the aircraft. Only, like, we have emergency deployable comm that, you know, yep. could talk to aircraft, but it didn't. So, like, I honestly, I didn't even know what the real Air Force was. So, so who <laughs> talks to who on your network? So, you establish, so it's basically, combat communications is, you could, we have satellite communications packages where you could roll out and you could set up an entire network for like a fob it's like initial base comm before you hit sustainment mode mm -hmm. um you could get i think our equipment did upwards of fifty thousand users or a hundred thousand users something like that i can't remember anymore but even then in the three years that i've been out of the game like they've changed those satellite uh communications packages so, you know, the capabilities, like you said, comm is always changing. Sure. Capabilities are always changing. Equipment's always changing. Yep. So we actually, uh, one of the things we have is called a JISC, the Joint Interoperability Incident, Communi incident something. Communications <laughs> something. Um, but we yeah. have one and the Air Force has one. Yeah, so that and, was our And tasker. we just got fielded um, what they're calling the, the B2 package. Oh, wow. So we just got a whole new package. Um, we did we did a couple weeks of testing on it, but literally it's it, it creates an entire network out of seven Pelican cases and a satellite dish which is now uh, commercial. So uh, and it can give you nipper, sipper, VoIP, the whole thing. And in the past, the discs that we had in the state have been at. Um, called up for inaugurations Yep. because it provides backup communications in the event your communications infrastructure with emergency services goes down. Um, every time there's some kind of hurricane or blizzard, it gets called up. Yep. So, and it comes, it's a, the package includes um, different parts of communications because you have your people for radio. Yep. Because, you know, you think IT and you think one person can do all of it in IT. But really in IT, it's a bunch of different groups that have these specialties that come together and they make the whole network work. Sure. So is the is the JISC sensitive? Is that something we can take a picture of? Um, can we show the audience what the JISC looks like? Yeah, it's um, yeah. it's commercial. There's yeah. stuff. Okay. You can Google it. Yeah. Right now right. it's in a bunch of boxes in the back of a trailer. But yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could show seven Pelican boxes. Right so I actually, I, can, I have some pictures I can send you. Okay. So from our training. Is there a, oh, nice. any training in the future schedule where it's going to get set up? Well, I, I am still a new, new officer. I still put myself in that group. So as a new officer, you know that there are gobies, right? The good idea fairy who, uh, I have big plans. All right. So, are you calling yourself a good idea fairy? Kind of. Oh. Ooh, tell me, tell me some of these good ideas. So some of these good <laughs> ideas. So it's one of the, the interesting things with... Um, you know, stepping into this new role as the G6, uh, looking at, so one of the pieces is even though we are, everybody in the six is a technician. Everybody in my office is required to wear the green suit. So which means, and you have to be a 25 series soldier in order to work full time in the G6. That means my feeders have to come from what I have out there in the field 
you know, in, in who's out there and who's got talent and who wants to work with us. One of the things I'm finding is that, you know, it's as a member of the Guard, as an officer of the Guard, part of my thing is recruiting and retention, always. 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 So, so I, I look at numbers and I, I analyze, because again, I'm, I'm a nerdy computer person, so numbers are Data. my thing. Data. So, you know, I analyze what is our retention of the 25s. Uh, I talk to them because there are not a lot of us at all. So, you know, I, I try to make those connections and say, hey, how's it going out there? Um, one of the things that I have identified that someday, I'm saying someday, because I can't say any time in the near future. Oh, no, we're definitely holding you to this. Someday. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the Air Force, where you have an entire unit of communications people, right? Uh, we don't have that here in the Army. So if you think of our line units, even Joint Force Headquarters, but all of it, it's we're more like a we're a small piece in every unit, right? So, so, so yeah. we're... You guys are very decentralized. Extremely decentralized. And what that means is you don't have that parent to go back to for support, right? So it's, I, I have a lack in training. I don't know about this equipment. I've had some turnover, whatever it might be. There's nowhere really to go to get help or get ideas. So my good fairy idea is someday I want, I want to change that. I want to be able within the six to provide support and to be able to, to get out there and, and help you know, the line units with their communication. Because the thing is, is that you know, without the signal, without the ability to communicate, nothing happens. So one of the sort of slogans of the G6 or of signal in general is, you can talk about us, but you can't talk without us. So that's catchy. Isn't that nice? That's very I catchy. did not catchy. make that up. Okay. That has been around for a very long time. Sure. I, I've seen the graphic designs that you make. I, I know you didn't make that. Ooh, up. How is that the first wow. time I've heard it? I've never heard that one. Yeah. I've always heard no calm, no bomb. Well, that too. Stuff like that. But yes, there are many, but that, that is the one that always stuck out in my mind. Go ahead. You can talk about us. You can talk about us combo people, but uh, you can't talk without us. So true. someday, someday I want to be able to provide some resources for, you know, those, those soldiers out, out in the, um, out in the line units and stuff and, and, and be able to provide support for technologies. Cause again, technologies change, but you know, if I don't have, you know, soldiers that are coming in on a sort of regular basis that get sped up on this stuff, then we're not ready for it. Or, come on, it's a guard, so the stuff we do get is probably four years behind what's being taught. But I don't have anybody who remembers how to use it. So, someday. Someday. It's building SOPs and... That kind of stuff. Or, you know, it, it's, it's getting someone who is, um, you know, passionate about tactical comms. So, the, the G6, uh, within the, the, the full-time force... Uh, we do not have sort of a federal, uh, not a federal, we do not have a TACCOMS mission, right? We, we are strictly network to protect the Doden, which is a piece of the, you know, the, the bigger network. Um, that's just the six, though, you said, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's not the, the unit level. No, so, so at that full-time G6 level, like we, we, I, I do have a ComSec manager, who deals with the security of keys and that kind of thing. Um, it's a little bit of his piece to, to do radios and he does like SOIs and that sort of thing, hands out frequencies. Um, but he's busy enough with all the stuff he has to do that be able to be that, hey, you know what, we're, we're going on AT and we wanna use you know, these blue force trackers. How do we use that effectively? How do we set them up? I can't send them out there for that. Someday I want to be able to do that. That um, was an interesting thing that we encountered um, before the 282nd became part of the 143rd Airlift Wing. The 143rd Airlift Wing has the communications flight, which supports base communications. Very different from tactical communications. Mm -hmm. But because we are in the same geographic location, it was easy enough for us when we'd go out, we would 
go to an exercise, we could say, hey, do you guys want to do some cross training on some tactical communications? And it was always good because it tactical communications is different in the sense that, you know, networks of bases mm-hmm. grow differently than mm-hmm. a tactical network. You just think and you plan differently. They have to do different things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, your TAC networks, they have to be more mobile. A base network, you just put it there and hope it and make it work. But a, a TAC yeah. network, you know, you got to get up and move sometimes. Um, or, you know, you start looking at the radios and, you know, it's not just one radio. There's, you know, I once went through a class and it was every radio the Army ever had and, or thought of having. And it, it literally was a, like a two-week class. Um, you know, there are so many different types of communication. And now you start adding in, we've got cell, we've got sat, we've got, you know, everything. And, and somehow we need to make that all work together. And if you're talking in a tactical environment, well, that's a whole nother layer. You know, COVID really huge for the G6 signal world um, with all the missions we've done and all the capabilities we needed. And we started with the civil unrest. That got us into a place we haven't been in so long. Um, T- tell us more about that. So obviously this last year, the National Guard has worked vastly differently yeah. than we've ever worked before. Yeah. Um, every section faced their own unique challenges. I want to hear about some of the sixes challenges over the last year specifically, how you tackled them, which ones you're still struggling with, that sort of thing. Still struggling with all of them. (laughs) No. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, for us, again, it's, you know, the mission of the six is the federal network. We we are not um, really provisioned. We are not, we are not funded. Um, We... (sighs) We really have very little to do with state mission um, or with units and that kind of thing or response. Like, that's just not how we're built to function. So we're built to function as that base, right? So we're base comms. But we start with, with, with COVID and we're getting out there and it's, again, it, there's nothing you do this, these days that doesn't have a computer attached to it. Right. So, so we have all of these mission sets out there trying to, you know, help out the state and help out, you know, the public. And they need all these computers. I'm, I'm not funded for that. I don't have them. But we put together what we could. We, we, we found computers in hobbit holes of places <laughs> and said somehow someone figure out how to make this work so we can help the mission. And then they needed comms. And we're like, all right, let, let's take a look at the radios. What can we use? And, you know, even that was like, radios? Really? We're going to go to radios? And, and it's, yeah, you know, it's, this is a capability we have. But what we did find is that very quickly, um, when this building was built and et cetera, you know, we moved in um, to the new Joint Force Headquarters, set the jock up and everything, uh, literally, honestly, days before... The, the COVID missions really started, our jock, you know, is, is still struggling with some communication um, as far as being able to reach all the missions out in the field. Hmm. So we're, we're correcting that. I've got this fantastic program that is going to be up and running real soon. Um, but, you know, that, that was one of the pieces we found, hey, we, we have a problem. You know, we, we need to be able to to talk and hear and fix this uh, without running, you know, lines into the woods, which we did. I set up OE two five fours in the middle of the woods in the back there. I think one of them's still standing. Actually. It is still standing. Yeah, we may um, or may not have admired it once or twice. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at yeah. that antenna. <laughs> Look at that. Yes, um, but that—that's how we're getting comms in right now. There are better solutions. We are getting there. Um, I just love that sense of, you know, this is. A, Nobody like allows the mission to fail. Never. No matter what, you're going to rally all the resources you have and you're going to make it work. And, you know, I just think I saw that across the board. No matter what part of the organization you worked for, people stood up and they made it happen no matter what the challenges were. And, I, you know, I think the emerging need for tech really, I think, didn't just hit the military hit everyone everywhere 
So yeah. I think it really, it created a challenge for people. Okay, how do we innovate? I think this is a great opportunity to ha- figure out how we can really innovate technology and, you know, move forward and change maybe some ways that we were doing business before because mm-hmm. we could always optimize. We can always what can be digital, what can be in person. Mm-hmm. And like, we just never had a challenge like this, like COVID mm-hmm. that put us in a situation where we had to rethink, you know, our standard business. Yeah. And I think oh. that's a great opportunity. It is. And, and you're right. I mean, look at, look at telework. Look at, oh my God, I wish I had taken out the stock in Zoom and Microsoft Teams. Um, but how it changes the way, not just the military, but even we change the way we work. But everybody changed the way they work. Um, and then you had, you know, we, when we start getting vaccines and et cetera, how quickly, you know, state IT departments had to spin up some sort of website to be able to allow you to register for a vaccine or how they were tracking data. All of that just had to come out of nowhere. Incredible. It's an incredible effort. It is. It is. And, and I think one, one of the um, most underrated skills of a good signalier is the ability to adapt and and to think outside the box like for one of me one one of the things i always ask for is you know when when you're asking for something like if you're asking my shop for hey i need you know a computer or this or that don't tell me the technology you need tell me what you need to do and I'll find a way to make it happen. It may not, most of the time, it will not be what you think you need. But I will make sure that I get you the functionality that you need. And we have to do that all the time. So interesting you say that. I was recently having a conversation with the superintendent for communications flight. And he said almost verbatim what you just said. It's like, don't tell me your requirements. Tell me what you want. What is your end goal here? Correct. And I'll design it. Right. So, and, and again, it, sometimes we, you know, certainly think outside the box, um, you know, but at the end of the day, it's about making sure that the mission gets done. So, and again, th- those were all COVID lessons and things like, you know, op board annexes. I got schooled in those too. Those are important. They are important. Those are really important. So that's one of the learning points that I've run across this year is... Everyone knows overseas that those are important, right? Mm-hmm. Like everyone knows, go to the annex, get what you need. Here domestically, we, I don't want to use the word lazy, but we've gotten complacent yes. with our annexes um, because it's easy, right? Here our cell phones work. Here yep. I can go to Dunkin' Donuts and jump on the Wi-Fi. And what we've discovered, at least I have, is uh, we go to the annexes and they j- just don't exist. Mm-hmm. We've essentially functioned off of con ops instead of upwards. Yep. Um, and a lot of these support functions, mm-hmm. S6, public affairs, uh, the annex just doesn't exist mm-hmm. or, or whatever. It's, it's incomplete. doesn't have the data you're looking for. So that's a, that was a big lesson learned for us. It was huge for me too. So same thing. You know, I spent some time in the jock and said, all right, if, if I'm going to do this, let me go read my annexes. And they were either missing or out of date. Um, so, you know, I got the opportunity to, to kind of create them or rebuild them, um, you know, and again, that, you know, so the, the COVID support was one thing when we hit that civil unrest, that was a whole nother mission set that required, you know, not just computers, but now you're talking life or death comms. Like it was much closer related to what we would see overseas, um, but without that support structure already being there. So for that, I was like, wow, we, we really need to make sure that, that we have this correct, that we are hooked up with state, that we able to have EMA and we can all talk at the same time. Who were some of your biggest interagency partners during? Definitely EMA. So, um, you know, it was with EMA and, and even still today, it's, you know, Department of Health. So, because we're, we're sharing some resources, we're bouncing off each other. Some things I just can't get. Um, you know, the government, we, we tend to put restrictions on what you can and can't do. So, sometimes in order to make missions happen, you know, we had to go to state and say, hey, can you guys provide this sort of technology? Um, 
but it would go back and forth. And then, and then it were, you know, again, just making sure that we were all on the same page with how do we communicate? You know, how do the forces that are out there in mission make sure that we can reach each other at any point in time? At a highly decentralized state of existence, right? Yes. Like, it's not like we're talking about two functional brigades talking to each other. We're talking about, I mean, teams of literally like four humans yeah. are going to go to some corner of Rhode Island to open a, a high density community yep. testing site. Yep. And it's like, well, they need access to the network. Right. Okay. And, that's, and, and that's they're going to be mobile. Right. So they're going to pick up and they're going to move. Today they're here, tomorrow they're over there. Um, yeah, but still I have to make sure that, you know, they can p- complete their mission. So yeah. how, how do you get them there? And, and, and which network do they need? Like, what are they doing? Do they need access to state? Do they need access to the guard? Um, do Sounds they like just a need lot commercial? Of coordination. It is. Yeah. Um, but what an experience. To be, to be able to say that, you know, I was able to participate in that and see that, um, it's, it's, just, it, it's just amazing. And then where that can push me for further, again, professional development, I asked for it, look what I got. <laughs> um, but that helps shape how we you know, do that prepared, preparedness um, because we did get complacent. We haven't had to do this stuff in a while. I mean, we were doing snowstorms. We can do those in our sleep. So, yeah, that's a, a well-oiled battle drill. Very right? much like so. Y- you move into EMA's jock. You know, we all know yep. each other. We do. On like almost a first name basis. Pretty much. And yeah. That's, uh, a, that's a well worked. That, that one we are great at. But this, this really expanded, you know, my, my sort of breadth of knowledge and the ability to, to see how we function and why documents like annexes and op boards yeah. are important. You know, uh, SOI, standard operating instructions for uh, radio frequencies. I don't know much about that till COVID. Oh, I know a lot now. So, um, but again, it's just just an amazing experience over the past year to be able to say I I was part of that. Yeah, it's been good. It's been good for us too. Yes. I think my favorite is uh, Department of Education. You would never expect the National Guard to work with the Department of Education. It's like, obviously, EMA. That that one's easy. State Police. Easy. Providence Police. Easy. Health and Human Services. All right, I can squint my eyes and see. All right, I can see the National Guard working with health. And education. And Department of Education. Yeah, where'd that come from? It's like, we didn't even know who our counterparts are. No. It's like, I, like, I don't even know who to introduce myself to over there. <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't know. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we capture that in our annexes moving forward. Hey, just in case another worldwide pandemic rolls out of a cardboard box. Right. Um, here's your, you know, counterparts of the Department of Education. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. So looking forward, I mean, we're kind of like at the tail end ish of COVID um, ish. Yeah. Uh, so what's, uh, what's next on the horizon for the six? What's like, what's the your next big project? So the next big project is actually, it's, it's one that is, uh, uh, it, it, it's either you love it or you don't. And that's the transition to O three sixty five, right? I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. You don't you love it. Do not. Mm, I haven't made my mind up yet. Mm, mm. She doesn't love it yet. No. <laughs> she doesn't. We will so, make a believer of you yet. We will. So, 0365, so it, when, when you talk about, you know, com- again, communications as a whole, and we look at things like email, um, you know, e- email is kind of standard. You, Everybody, as soon as you enlist and you get a cow card, you have an email. Whether you use it or not, you still have one. And it is the preferred sort of communication um, vehicle of choice for the Army, for, for many places. Like, that is the standard. So, you know, there have been changes over the years with email and government email, Army email. Um, and... You know, it had been... So the thing is, when, when you're working with email and that sort of thing, they require servers, lots of them, right? So, and servers, if you don't know, servers are very, very expensive, and they're hard to maintain. So there had been a time with email that it was at our level, right? And we controlled sort of our email. And then it got taken over by Big Army, right? And Big Army said, listen, we got gotcha. you. You're good. And, and they were handling the email. 
right? And those were back in the days when our email addresses ended with us.army.mil, right? And most people, I would argue, even didn't use it. No. You were going to do stuff in person. Things were still on paper, that sort of stuff. Um, You know, email was still kind of new. You know, AOL was fashionable back then so let's go with that <laughs> and let's be honest the army really likes holding on to the old correct the old ways correct we were probably still sending out carrier pigeons like you guys were transitioning to email we were still etching stone tablets Co- correct that, guys that sort of thing. very we, adamant we, we about your tradition flags <laughs> yeah 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 um but one of the things that happened is when you know the army owned their own email is we were starting this idea of being joint but we couldn't talk to our joint partners, right? So we were actually talking about this earlier, but you know, you you could not cross talk. You couldn't send encrypted emails from army to air. Um, When I worked in HRO, I was on an army network. And if I had to work through some sort of pay issue with the Air Force Finance Office, I couldn't exchange information because they couldn't read our encryption. So, so how do carrier you pigeons, right? With encryption, in order to get it there, like you were literally or the hand, the facts, or oh, the facts. Oh, I mean, the we facts. still do that with a couple of systems. We right? do, yeah. we do. There are definitely some systems where a human has to get a report from, like, say, GCSS, yeah, and then hand jam those numbers into another system. Mm-hmm. That still exists. It, it does still exist. I dream of a day when that doesn't exist anymore. It does. You know, COVID though, kind of circling back to that has kind of also brought that back up so if comms do fail yep what's our uh contingency there and i've heard people start to talk about going and have instituting some paper backups again Oof. i dread the day though oh god <laughs> Oof. Oof. paper you can i feel like you can lose paper more easily than you could a digital record yeah so like there's really only two two things you can do with paper either you lose it and you have no access to that information or you don't lose it and you just are buried in endless mounds of paperwork yeah. yes and you get a situation where i move into a cubicle at the s6 and i spend a year and a half throwing away <laughs> 40 years worth of accumulated paperwork correct because oh, you never know you just might need that post-it that you wrote in 1997. Correct. With that, that you never know. Well, people that. do the same with email and everything else they create digitally, too. So Yeah, you got to have true. a good archive. you got to have you a do. solid archive. You do. You do. But So we went to the interoperability issue. They said, all right, we're going to fix that. And they put everybody. Now we went to mail.mil, right? And everybody's under the same umbrella. The entire military force is under the same umbrella. Well, the people who were hosting that were like, hey, people, this, this is too big. This is too many people. This is hard. This is very, very expensive. We're going to look at, again, technology changing, cloud. We're going to go cloud. So DOD, DISA, all those, those sort of agencies, those four-letter agencies who you know, really scrutinize and tell us you know, what's okay and what's not okay said, you know what? We're ready. We're going cloud. So we're going cloud. But they said, when we go cloud, you're splitting up again. So you are no longer mail.mil. We now have USA.AF.mil for Air Force. And the Army is going back to US.Army.mil. Are we really? We are. It's a long story. I got to start reading those emails. To go to the (laughs) USA.Army. We were USA. We're now back to US.Army. A long story. Someone needed an OER bullet point. It's like super important. It's something. Yeah. But we're us.army.mil. But there was a small time where it was .ang.af.mil. I remember that. Yeah. So when I start typing your name into my Outlook, it still populates that Oof. email. And it's shenanigans because when I'm not paying attention, I get about half of the emails I send you get bounced back because that no it. longer you exists. You can clear that so it doesn't happen anymore. You might know somebody that could help Maybe you. you yeah, might know <laughs> somebody who can help you clear your cache so you're not <laughs> auto-completing things anymore. Sometimes it's a good tool. Yeah, it is. I'll help you with that. I feel like there should be a 10 things that you could be doing, like IT episode. Here's the problem with that episode. The only people who would watch that are the people who you know need that the least. The people who most need the 10 tips... Are I the would, people who are not I would watched. use it. I'd, 
I would you? Would, I would clear my cache so that I, I wasn't sending it to the wrong. I'd film that captain. and I would just pull the ripcord and be done. Okay. <laughs> we, 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 we could do a, a, ten, a 10 advanced things. I like that. Yeah. Not the basics, but this is for that user that knows how to turn it on and you know can do the basics. You but just this, plug is, it in. this is kind of the cool stuff. This is the stuff you don't need admin rights for, but you can find some really cool like things. Like how to set up a PST. You won't even have to do that anymore. Not with the cloud? With, with the, the cloud. cloud. That's wonderful. So that's kind of cool. And if you're agreeing to be on camera and be my actor, I would love to film that. We will discuss. Okay. That we, can come up, we can come up with five, ten, ten things. Make it I happen. I mean, as long as it's not, uh, it probably needs to be two hands, and it can't be <laughs> ten, because that looks weird on camera. Probably not nine, because it's hard to curl a, <laughs> one finger. So let's, let's do eight. Eight. I like let's eight. Like arbitrarily select eight, because it looks good on. Well, you're going to do eight things. Eight, eight, eight. Yeah, you gotta gotta use the thumb though. That's like classic YouTube. Uh, they always yeah, count with the I don't, thumb. Oh no! I don't bend. <laughs> your your pinky's all broken. It doesn't bend. Oh, that's weird. No, nope, nope. neither does that one. Now you look like you're flashing gang signs on my podcast. I'm trying not to. <laughs> We're just trying to count to eight here. <laughs> trying to count to eight. I don't know. It's the best idea, but we can try. Um, well, also you don't have to do it that weird way. <laughs> I would just have done this. Eight. What? Who, who counts that way? I do. I do. Yeah, okay. see? <laughs> you're, you're both just objectively wrong. This is not how you count to eight. <laughs> eight. But yeah, I think we can find a few things where we can, we can do an advanced, you can be a cool IT person too. I like, I it. like it. Actually, I do kind of like the idea of this. Yeah. And it would probably be good with the new rollout for O365. Love it. Because there are some cool, cool things. Because that's starting right now. So I actually just got my email yes. this morning that said, yes. congratulations, you're now an O365 user. Correct. And you know what you're getting with your O365? Tell me. So, A one terabyte storage for my email. Yeah. Super excited. One terabyte of storage. Are you ready to send it? I am so ready to send it. Um, but here's the question. So will Outlook actually properly index my one terabyte of emails or will it just randomly delete my index every month like it does now? I don't have an answer for that yet, but I can tell you. So right now your Outlook is capped at, I don't have. Four gigabytes? Does that sound right? Five. Ten. No. Uh, I didn't bring my, my graphic. There's a graphic. We could flash that. I, I, I do have a graphic. Okay, I do. you send that to us. So, we'll... so there is a graphic and it shows you, right? Like, right. So one of the things right now, right? So you have your Outlook, which not everybody gets, right? Outlook, the, 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 the actual Outlook, the Outlook app, yep. right? That is not standard. That is for full-time force only. Really? Yes. Full-time if, permanent. Yes. Yeah. If you are an MDAY or an ADOS, you're using Outlook web app. So you're getting there through owa.mil, right? Got it. Some of us use the Outlook because we have access to the app. Um, if you are M-Day, you have a smaller storage capacity if you're forced to use OWA. If you have the Outlook, it's a little bigger. Not much, but a little bigger. Mm. When we move over to O365, everybody gets 100 gigs of space in your Outlook. And Can't I guarantee imagine you, being an M day that ever used all of that, like what would I be doing? I, <laughs> you, you would be a very, very important M day. <laughs> yeah, you would. You would, or you've subscribed to an awful lot of newsletters with your military ID, <laughs> one or the other. I don't want the ones I have now. <laughs> but everybody's going to be on the same playing field. So regardless, because that is probably one of the biggest hurdles that we face right now again the, right now the, the ring network the rhode island army national guard network is not meant for m-day activities it's not meant for m-day soldiers it is the federally funded full-time force that it is built for that it is maintained for but the problem is is that it's you know, maybe back in the day, that was okay, because during the M day, we were doing things on paper, you were, you know, you weren't doing as much, um, you were out actually in the woods doing army-like things, or whatnot, right? The army, according to our IT section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they were in the woods doing army things. Army things. Army what things. What is that? Whatever. Eating bugs, you know, living in the dirt. What? 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 You never eaten a bug? 
No, I don't need bugs. Doing land nav. You kidding? Ooh, I love land nav. I'm really bad at it, but I love it. <laughs> um, but today, it's, you know, even to just do a PHA, you have to be on the military network to do part of that. So, you know, there's more need at the M day level to have access to things. So um, the cloud is making that access poss- uh, better? For parts. Not for everything. It's definitely not a fix. So things like if, if you need to actually be on the ring network, the cloud doesn't help that. Um, but one of the pieces is, you know, it's, we, we see a lot of soldiers that come on for ADOS or they come on, you know, sort of as a temp tech. They were, they're this COVID thing, right, where we have 500 something soldiers, um, but they're still bound to that. I only have this teeny tiny little mailbox and I have to get to it through the web and that sort of thing. Um, th- this is going to make that easier because everybody is the same. So, and again, if you're full time on the ring, we give you what we call the T drive. You ever heard us talk about the T drive? It is four whole gigs of your own space that will back up. So don't leave stuff on your desktop because chances are you're hard drive is going to crash and we're going to lose it all take your important stuff put it in the t drive and then every time you're on the network you can get to it no matter what computer with o365 it's a terabyte and as long as you can get to the app you can get to all your documents and again it doesn't matter if you're a full-timer or an m day you now have access to stuff so Plus you have the, the, the ability to do the remote learning and the teleconferences and, you know, for those units that are out there where we do the pre-drill meetings, it had been, we used to do them, you know, via phone conference and you couldn't see anything. So, you know, everybody's just kind of like, okay, so what time am I showing up on, you know, Saturday morning, whatever. We do them today and we do it with teams and there's the slide. There's my weekend schedule. That's nice. So... That's not going away. It's helpful. It is. It is. Yeah. I'll and jump in here and, and plug teams. So go for it. Um, I went to Captain's Career course this past summer, mm-hmm. and thanks to COVID, it was 100% remote. So normally it would be two weeks remote, in person, remote, in person. Yep. It was entirely remote. It was taught entirely on MS Teams. Mm-hmm. The the entire thing we did. We never migrated off of MS Teams for anything. We took our tests. We um, took our classes. We briefed. We received briefs mm-hmm. entirely on Teams, and uh, I'm very excited for that to be like a, a part of how we do our work. Um, I think it's extremely intuitive. Mm-hmm. I think my my sense as I navigate around it is that I think it was developed for people who are not comfortable on computers because it is super straightforward. And it's not as deeply functional as perhaps some other thing. So if you're like an advanced Discord user mm-hmm. or you're an advanced Streamlive user, this isn't quite that functional. Right. But it is unbelievably straightforward. Mm-hmm. For the uh, general audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. If you've ever used an instant messenger and you've ever used a, a Google shared document, mm-hmm. you're done. Yep. Like that's this. This is that. Mm-hmm. But all in one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm very excited. I think I think the team, the migration to Teams is going to be awesome. See, that's where I think innovation is going to be big, is having that interoperable thing, the thing that connects you to all of your members. So um, before I started in public affairs, I worked for the VA. I did HR for the VA in a large organization, and I worked in, in hiring. We did the recruiting for the VA hospitals. And... You know, there's a lot of dense policy. There's a lot of stuff, like complicated information that you really need to know in order to do your job well. So um, we had, I think it was Link and Skype. We went through a a couple different programs while we were there. But being able to have webinars Mm -hmm. that connected entire regions of that organization was instrumental to my development and my growth and my proficiency so that I was doing a really good job making sure I was hiring the right people to take care of our veterans. So like, um, it was, I was really happy to see that 
you know, something that I saw work really well at the VA is something that we've started to implement mm-hmm. here. And I think there's a ton of potential for us to continue to standardize our processes through big seminars and webinars using this platform. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. And I mean, it's for, you know, if I look at a unit in general, um, you know, again, the full-time force, we have access to things, share drives, that sort of stuff where we put documents and whatever, but your typical M day soldier can't ever get to them, you know? So it's, again, th- this gives the opportunity where everybody's on the same platform. So, and it's without taxing my full-time G16 to be like my entire unit of 174 people need to have ring accounts so we can get to something. Like, that's not what they're built for. That's, that's, not, that's not the purpose of them. They're, and, and as, again, Signalier saying, well, what do you need to do? Let me see what the resources are. Teams gives us the ability to put so many of these pieces that we have to do separately into one. And it's single sign-on. So you get your email, you get your OneDrive, they're moving the SharePoint there, so the Rhode Island GKO page. No longer do you have to have, here's my email, here's my, my, my share drive. I had to open another browser to be able to get to the Save about GKO a thousand page. favorites in your bookmarks. It's all one application. And it's going to be all your office products. So your Word, your Excel, your PowerPoint, all going to be accessible in one platform. That's helpful. Yeah. It, it, it's got really exciting opportunities. And again, as sort of your knowledge management signalier type people, part of our job and one of the cool things we get to do is to figure out, you know, what are the command requirements? What are you trying to do? How, you know, what do you want people to have access to? And then we build it. You know, if you build it, they will come. Um, are you quoting Bugs Life? No. no. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> That's not Bugs Life. What is that? Bugs Life is quoting Ali. Um, um, oh God, what's a baseball movie? Uh, a, f- a Field of Dreams. Field of. Oh my God, am I showing my age? Kevin Costner builds the baseball field in the cornfield. I've, I've probably seen it, but I'm not. Joe one Jackson for sports. comes out. You're killing me. Sorry. Oh my God. Hi. That's the We're not sports. That is the original. Where it um, came from. Where it came from. The, yes. The origin story. Yes. I love this. Yes. Not Bugs Life. <laughs> Baseball movie. Normally I would pipe in and say Bugs Life probably did it better, but because we're talking Kevin Cosner, really? I actually can't use that joke. You gotta, it, it was a good movie. I don't think there's any improving Kevin Cosner. Not much. Not unless you cast, like maybe Gary Oldman could do something better than Kevin Cosner, mm. but like you're already, you're in that S tier. Mm. Mm. I, I don't see anyone really beating Kevin Cosner. Mm-mm. Mm. Certainly not Disney Pixar. Not Disney Pixar. No. No. So I think that about does it. Is there anything we didn't cover? I I think think (laughs) that's about everything. So we'll ask you one last time. Yeah. Who is Captain De Palma? Uh, I am your more friendly, gentler Army G6 is who I am. (laughs) And that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think we introduced ourselves. You didn't. Captain.